Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar on how to improve uh, your compliance checks with RegTech. Uh, we're going to hold on for about two minutes uh, to let a few stragglers join, and we'll be back with you then. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar on uh, prepaid and fintech firm KYC practices and the report we've uh, done in conjunction with PIF. I'm joined by Diane Brocklebank, Executive Director of PIF. Thank you, Simon. Uh, hello and uh, welcome everybody to our webinar. Um, just a very quick introduction to PIF um, in case you're not familiar. Um, we are the uh, not-for-profit industry body representing the prepaid and fintech sectors. Um, we're delighted to have had this opportunity uh, with Who You um, just to uncover some of the, the processes and technologies um, our members uh, use to, to onboard new customers. Um, we're very grateful um, to our members for taking part in this project. Um, which has created a very positive um, set of findings that we can use to promote um, a positive image of the industry. Thank you very much. And I'm also joined by David Pope, uh, the Marketing Director for Who You. Good afternoon, everybody. Hey, Simon. <laughs> hey, and I'm Simon. I'm the Product Marketing Manager for Who You. And we're going to have a, a webinar and a quick fireside chat uh, about this report. But let's uh, kick off uh, with. The first thing, which is if you have any questions during the webinar today, please ask them. There's a panel down on the right hand side within the go to webinar thing, uh, as you'll see circled here. Feel free to ask us away at any questions and uh, we'll get to them at the end. So let us kick off by what was the objective and uh, what was the point for this report in, in the first place? So we're really trying to, as you can see, avoid this type of PR for prepaid. Um, we wanted to show um, the uh, stakeholders in our industry, be that regulators, um, law enforcement and others, that our industry really does take um, its responsibilities for compliance as seriously as it does its quest for growth. Excellent. And so the report is available. Um, you can 
click on the link here to, to go and get it. Uh, but uh, it's a report sharing research conducted with PIF members uh, to uncover the extent of KYC technologies and gain insight into the due diligence process. Uh, anything further? And it's, it's really based on real world evidence. Um, so the, the, the processes, the technologies, the extent of the technologies that our members are using um, in their customer onboarding process. Um, it was all completely uh, anonymous. Uh, we don't know who the respondents are. Um, so it's, it's a really good insight um, that we can use. And as I said before, um, it creates very crucial evidence for us as an industry. Okay, so let's dive straight in uh, to the technologies that have been used. And quite amazingly, uh, here is a, a list of the, the KYC technologies that are being deployed by PIF members. Now, they answered this anonymously, but um, the thing that strikes me from this is the vast array of the technologies being used and the large percentage of it. Um, obviously, we've got 100% for, for database checks and an ID document validation, but even things along the lines of device reputation, still a, over a quarter of members are using that. Uh, fraud rules, the, the lowest uh, appears to be video call identification, but I guess that's partly because a lot of that's taken up by facial biometrics and the technologies being implemented within selfies, uh, enabling them to, to bypass that. Uh, but if we go slightly deeper into the results, uh, the adoption by KYC technology, and we can go through the list. First of all, we've got traditional database checks. Now, 100% of, of members reported that they were using name and address, date of birth checks, and uh, ID document validation. Now, these are your kind of classic database checks uh, that the vast majority of people, and um, we'll go into it later on, will find a hit. Uh, there will be certain exceptions and certain reasons why we need to go further in and, and do other validation checks. Um, we've got PEPs and sanctions checks. Dave, do you have uh, any insight into, into the large amount of people using those? Uh, yeah, so, so this is kind of like all taken in conjunction with the name, the address, the date of birth checks and the document validation. Obviously, uh, PIF members, FinTech firms, they all, they all adhere to the Joint Money Laundering Steering Group guidance notes. Uh, which of course says that uh, regulated um, firms have to do have to check both positive and negative databases that are quote updated over the course of time. So the name, address, and date of birth checked is the positive database side of things. The PEPs and sanctions checked so that's the negative database side of things. And obviously PEPs is the physical exposed um, physical exposed persons, and the um, uh, and also the um, uh, the organised criminals, the terrorist financiers, the terrorists. Uh, that one must not do business must not do business with. Um, so, of course, what we also found from members is that, um, in terms of the PEPs and sanctions data, uh, they already knew they're already quite well educated that the latest money laundering directive um, says that it has to be not just uh, foreign PEPs but also domestic PEPs as well. In fact, when we did this research, we found that there's really good knowledge um, throughout the sector, throughout the recipients of the ins and outs and requirements of, um, of, of KYC technology. Yeah, there seems to be a genuine keenness uh, within the industry to adopt this, this KYC technology and make it as efficient uh, for both compliance uh, needs and at the same time for, for convenience of end users and for, for people uh, trying to be onboarded. Uh, you can see this by 81% uh, of people using, or 86% doing address validation, and then 71% are using fraud rules. Again, fraud history rolled into that. Over 50%, over half are using facial biometrics checks, making sure that, the, that not only are they getting matched on uh, databases, but if they need to go and do further KYC, that the, the person is who they say they are and are willing to, to do that. Digital footprint analysis is another really, really good way of, of doing this. Uh, Dave, what are, what are some of the kind of benefits of digital footprint analysis outside of, outside of uh, a traditional KYC and database checks? Um, <clears throat> so basically, both the, the digital footprint analysis and the facial biometrics, they're both going above and beyond the uh, the requirements of the money laundering directive, the uh, the 
2017 money laundering regs, the journalist guidance notes, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but the reason that um, merchants, some merchants do uh, go above and beyond is that it's all about um, impersonation detection and preventing identity theft. So there's an argument to say that uh, the more data breaches there are, um, then that checking a database to confirm someone's identity is no longer really the defence it, it used to be. So that's why um, a lot of merchants go above and beyond uh, the database checks to do stuff such as, such as facial biometrics and the um, and, and, and the digital footprint analysis. A lot of the um, uh, the challenger banks that we work with, um, specific, especially some of the ones uh, who come to us and haven't. Um, uh, been working in banking before, which is quite common for challenger banks. Uh, they'll commonly say, "Oh, Dave, you know, why, why we would just want to check a database? Surely we want to check an ID document and do facial biometrics as well." And so there's already a kind of willingness in the fintech and prepaid sectors to look beyond what the regs say, but do what they think is is, is fit for purpose. Um, and of course, um, all the firms we spoke to as well, uh, they're all implementing KYC on a risk-based approach which means that based on the risk they see in that application, then they will call forth further tools such as facial biometrics and digital footprint analysis as well. And again, that's going to be because uh, of a generational thing. A lot of younger generations or, or people uh, who've moved to the country don't necessarily appear on those database checks. Uh, therefore, they can follow this risk-based approach and go through the additional uh, facial biometrics, digital yeah. footprint analysis, and are more likely to have access to that and at the same time offer a nice user journey for, for the person doing the application. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, um, there's some fast-growing fintechs um, who specifically target uh, that demographic, the, 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 the news of the, com the news country. So Minis, for example, are very well known for that. Uh, Suits Me Card, uh, which is one of, one of our clients, uh, they, uh, they, use, they use these digital footprint analysis technologies. Um, and when we present to regulators, they really like the digital footprint analysis because it helps them to um, know that somebody isn't being excluded from getting access to a financial instrument just because they don't appear on the on, on the traditional legacy uh, identity databases. Um, and in particular, for some of our money transfer clients, when uh, they use our digital footprint analysis tools, what they what we see is that their customers get really high scores in terms of digital footprint analysis because they're always using these tools to stay in touch with their friends and family back home and to build their new network in, in the country where, you know, where, where, they, where they've now come to. Yeah, I mean, it's incredibly difficult uh, to create a, a fraudulent digital footprint that stands up to any kind of uh, rigorous investigation uh, because most of us have had social media or had the you know access to, to paypal and things like that for many many years have done transactions have have met or spoken to a lot of people on it and have a lot of uh different connections that that can't be replicated in a, in a kind of fraudulent way yeah i mean um there's an argument to say that uh it's harder to fake a digital footprint than it is to pay 20 pounds and go and get hold of a, of a fake driving license from novelty-driving-licenses.co.uk. Although, don't visit that website. No, no that's just a do, top do. tip. Um, also, uh, other technologies being implemented, geolocation. Geolocation is obviously in, incredibly powerful, uh, especially if you've got an applicant with an address claiming to be in one place, whilst clearly they're in a, they're in a, a totally different country or various things, it can bring up a lot of things. Device reputation, uh, nearly a third of, uh, of PIF members are using device rep, uh, reputation. And then the final one, which was we meant, touched on earlier, video call identification, the 14%. This one I feel is a bit unfair because it kind of loops in at the same thing as, as facial biometrics. And a lot of people are using that technology rather than video call yeah. identification because there is more of a more of a friction to video call identification. Customers aren't probably speaking from personal experience uh, as a happy or as a or as adept at doing a video call for, for a bank account as they are of taking a selfie yeah i mean when there was the big crypto boom uh, last year uh, the firms the regulated firms that were using video identification their kyc pr practices ground to a halt because the video call process takes about um, 10 minutes to go through. It's charged at something like eight euro um, ago, um, and it requires the user having having an, an adequate mobile phone signal to go through a video call, uh, which 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 doesn't always work. So it's not that popular technology. 
Um, it's not used very much here in the UK. It is used um, extensively in the German market, where that's part of the uh, of BaFin, which is the, uh, the equivalent of the Financial Conduct Authority. It's part of their, their regulatory um, guidance. But moving on, the, uh, we've got the efficiency here of the, the technology you, uh, used. Um, and as we've touched on before, 69% of the time, uh, PIF members were able to uh, identify and verify uh, to regulatory standards with um, just name and address and date of birth uh, database checks, which is pretty pretty high, pretty impressive, um, but also does mean that there's a nearly a third of of customers not getting through at this point. And as I mentioned before, some of these are going to be the young, the new to country, the the ones that just don't appear on those traditional database checks. And I think the real thing to take away from the report is that it hasn't stopped at the 69 percent they're not you know nobody's accept it, accepting the 69 percent uh goes through and then the rest don't constant development of making it you know as, as as high as it possibly can uh to get people verified um and again when the database checks for 100 percent of PIF members ask customers to provide id documents and uh address documents which goes to show uh, you know that it, they are so keen on on making the, this process as, as useful for everybody involved uh, and then 50 percent of those uh, use an external document validation service 57 percent so that's a, a that's a large number that do it and again there are there are a percentage that do it in-house um, and again this is the the real key thing of how long does the uh, ID document validation take and and people have become extremely keen with it being done as, as, as fast as possible. So 29% uh, are done within 10 minutes, 14% uh, within two hours. And then again, the other two 29% take between <clears throat> five hours and a day. But again, it's all done within a day, which is still far better than the, the old days of having to take your, your, your photo ID and your documents into a into a branch and get it approved. Yeah, or pop them in the post. Yeah, or pop them in the post or get it to get it signed but offered a a, um, a post office yeah, yeah. or something to get it sent in so again the the range of technology now being used uh, by by PIF members is is extensive I think the um the timing there is skewed uh, by the the firms that are doing document validation in-house and if you're using an external provider um, then it certainly shouldn't be taking um, uh, even 10 minutes but for the these numbers are skewed here in terms of uh, where it says five hours or one day. That's not how long um, uh, an internal team um, is taking to review the documents. Um, that's the, uh, if you're looking at a prepaid and fintech company, that's how long it takes for their staff to get through the queue of documents have to be reviewed, approve them and go back to the customer to say that account opening uh, is taking. If you're using an external document validation um, provider, then it, it, it should certainly be taking well less than 10 minutes. Well, I think we're seeing it here again. When database checks are successful, uh, the 50% said that it takes less than five minutes, uh, and then the other 50% takes up to 15 minutes. So, regardless, 100% of uh, of applications when database checks are successful are, are going through in under 15 minutes. Uh, and I think this is where um, these sort of providers and, and PIF members are pulling away from traditional banks. In the fact that you they can onboard a customer uh, through the through the process in less than in less than 15 minutes, which traditional high street banks are now trying to catch up with, but but have traditionally failed and traditionally struggled at this point. Uh, again, if we look at further into this, the compliance versus convenience uh, and how long account opening takes. When we look deeper into the when database checks are not successful, again, the vast majority are, are done within one day. 14% uh, are done within 15 minutes. 14% are done within half a day. But as Dave has previously alluded to, this isn't necessarily down to, down to the uh, speed and the checking available it's it's down to the technologies being used and whether it's being handled in-house or, or externally by by a provider um, I know from personal experience that we you know we can onboard a lot faster than that uh, as long as 
as long as the documents are provided uh, and can be <clears> approved <throat> yeah. exceedingly quickly. Yeah. I think the other thing in here that skews the stats is that um, some of the uh, PIF members who respond to the survey, um, they deliver uh, B2B oriented uh, prepaid products and their, the, the, their client onboarding process does, does take, take longer. They have to uh, do a bit more checking on the rationale for the transaction. Uh, the checking of the beneficial owners, the persons as a significant control and, and that sort of thing. So I think that probably skews the stats. If you're looking just at um, consumer um, uh, prepaid or fintech um, onboarding, then the, the timing would, 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 be, would be much quicker. So if we go into the, uh, the compliance versus convenience and the what percentage of applications are finished, 66% uh, are completed whilst 34 percent uh, are left not completed. Uh, Dave, any insight into why you think the 34 <clears> percent <throat> are not getting finished? What are yeah. the what are the uh, barriers to, to completion at this point? Okay. So um, before we go on to that, just in terms of what you were saying a minute ago, how you see prepaid and fintech firms pulling away uh, from traditional financial services, um, that statement is totally borne out in these uh, in these figures here. So when we did this equivalent uh, process with retail banks uh, just over a year ago, uh, we interviewed five of the biggest retail banks in the UK, um, and the equivalent stats were that 53% were completed. Um, uh, so therefore, um, what we're seeing here is that prepaid and fintech firms are already performing better on completion of account opening processes compared to uh, traditional uh, retail banks. So it's not just within the margin of error that you'd expect, it's far, they're far exceeding uh, traditional banks. Uh, yeah, and I think, I think, yeah, I think yeah, that's reflected in the, in a, the, kind of, you know, the demographics of, of, of the PIF membership. Uh, the, the fintech world, you know, they want to take a, a new approach to things. And now, sure, you know, the banks are um, uh, really are copying them uh, in terms of their obsession with the digital customer journey. Um, but they're, they're a little bit behind the curve. Uh, there was a brilliant quote from somebody that was presenting at Fintech Connect last week um, from DBS Bank, which is one, one of Asia's largest banks. And um, uh, I think Finextra uh, wrote it up. And um, the, the headline was brilliant. It says, um, uh, banks just can't put on digital lipstick and, and expect <laughs> to, um, uh, to be seen as digital leaders. That's a great quote. Uh, so moving back over to, to the, the PIF recommendations, uh, Diane, do you want to talk us through where you see the recommendations? And Yeah, absolutely. And I think the um, one of the first things is um, to uh, review the recent um, uh, FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority's um, uh, e-money and prepaid thematic review. So this was a, a review that they began last year um, to assess uh, the money laundering and terrorist financing risk posed by the e-money sector. Um, the, the findings were um, extremely positive for the, for the industry and demonstrated a very good um, uh, culture of compliance, um, both, uh, both within uh, uh, member firms and obviously the wider prepaid and, and fintech. Um, sector. Um, we would also um, uh, recommend um, that, uh, that firms in the sector work with us um, to add, add weight um, to, to our representations uh, to the industry regulators. Um, and uh, of course, it goes without saying um, that, uh, that, that everybody should be ensuring that they have um, a robust um, ID verification technology um, and AML processes to your, your digital customer journey. So uh, moving on from, from those recommendations, uh, we're now gonna look at who you, which is, uh, who PIF did the report in association with and who Dave and I represent. Uh, I would just give a brief background on, on who we are. Um, we are kind of the, the grandparents of uh, the online database, uh, having started 192.com uh, many, many years ago in, in 1997. Uh, we've got a background in, in verification and uh, our database checks. We then came together a few years ago to, to create a new uh, organization called Who You, uh, of which we have two products. 
One is who you identify, the other is who you investigate. Uh, who you identify is a, a global identity confirmation service uh, that verifies identities using a combination of all the things we've previously discussed from digital footprint to ID document authentication, uh, biometrics, PEPs and sanctions, age confirmation, AML checks, everything along those lines. And then we have Investigates, uh, which is a unique uh, investigation service to uh, visualize data and visualize uh, any individual business or address, see the connections to that, that entity, see how those are connected to other entities uh, and find hidden links, hidden things that you wouldn't normally uh, discover between them. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about who you investigate now because that's my area of expertise. Um, who you investigate is revolutionary in, in its own way uh, for being the only service where not only are you looking at traditional databases that, that you're probably all used to, to dealing with, be it the electoral roll, being with company's house, uh, director's details, property ownership, uh, phone numbers, email addresses, all of these kind of databases. Uh, we're the only people that have ever managed to integrate those into a visual investigation tool, uh, enabling you to look at somebody that, that may be uh, applying for an account or a business that's applying for an account and look at all of the connections and investigate deeper. Uh, it's a highly powerful anti-fraud investigation tool that is used by a raft of different organizations uh, from local government, central government, to uh, big retailers such as Apple. Uh, and it enables you to really visualize data in a way that hasn't been possible up until now. Um, but moving on from that, we'll, uh, we'll go on to who you identify. And I'll pass over to Dave, who can talk you through the entire identity process. Thanks, Simon. So, uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, so who you identify is our customer onboarding platform who investigate is our back-end fraud investigation platform uh, and what we've really done with who you identify it's the sum total of our experience over the last uh, 15 years or so uh, to basically bring together lots of different forms of identity technology there's, there's lots of identity companies out there but broadly speaking they all do something different so you have some companies who are good at database checks other companies do uh, document validation other companies do peps and sanctions uh, and we're kind of like old enough and ugly enough uh, to be able to knit them all together into one platform. Now, the reason we bring together our different technologies, it isn't just so that our clients only have one vendor to manage, one API to integrate. The reason we bring together the different technologies is so that we can look across the results of the, of the identity tech we're using to drive and derive greater insight that uh, our clients' customers are who they say they are. So as opposed to just doing a... Uh, document validation and looking at someone's digital footprint analysis, what we do is we'd stop and say, okay, right, so hang on, so we like this ID documents, uh, we don't think this is, a, this is a forgery, but wait, how can we drive extra confidence in the ID document and the identity of the customer as a whole by looking across to perhaps their digital footprint from uh, PayPal or LinkedIn or Facebook to say, right, well, is it the same person with the same name, the same date of birth, the same gender, the same nationality? In other words, how can we use multiple sources to drive a maximum confidence that, that them customers are who they say they are? And we turn that into uh, an identity confidence score. So uh, one of the key things to understand about the digital footprint analysis that we do is that this is a fairly new way of verifying someone's identity. Um, but the regulators really like it, A, because it helps um, prevent financial exclusion, but B, because it really target hardens uh, firms against the increased risk of identity theft and identity fraud uh, in today's age of data breach. And what we do here is we don't take this data at face value, we really examine and interrogate that data. It's only ever done with the express permission um, of the user there and then um, at the point of um, uh, of them giving their permission uh, for who you to examine their digital footprint. Um, and we we look at the data from multiple angles. So in the, in the example of Facebook, what we'll do there is we'll look at something like 300 different data points, but the obvious ones you can imagine are that we'll look at how old is the account and how many people are they connected to. So in other words, is it a, an account that was made last night for the purposes of defrauding uh, a fintech? Um, or does the account go back two, three, five, or up to 10 years. 
um, and are they connected to like 10 other dodgy profiles or are they connected to scores if not hundreds of people we'll also measure the amount of content that's gone through that so for example the number of posts uh, the number um, of photos and number of um, book reviews the number of albums um, and so on and so forth uh, and the really clever bit inside there is that we then measure how many other profiles are interacting with that person's content so for example my stats on facebook are that i'm connected to 159 people but 247 other accounts have interacted with, with my data so exponentially mathematically it, it puts a really huge hurdle in the way of the fraudster uh, because they have to have not just one uh, fake digital footprint but um hundreds of other digital footprints that in effect give legitimacy to that digital footprint. So that's very, that's a very powerful part of the process. Uh, of course, our clients can just use um, uh, whichever aspect of, of who you identified that they want to. They don't have to use the whole thing. They can use uh, the separate components, of course. Um, and uh, this is a very commonly used component, the ID document authentication. Uh, from the survey, we know that 100% of, um, of PIF members uh, do document authentication when the database check fails. And so what who you has here is a set of proprietary um, pieces of technology uh, that using computer vision examines security features on the ID document. So, for example, that could be <clears throat> the um, looking at the hologram, looking at the kineogram, looking at the microprint, looking at the machine readable zone, uh, comparing the data uh, between the two uh, and really uh, trying to check to see how much confidence we can build in the identity document. Uh, and of course, what we're doing is any source that's presented into who you identify, we're cross-referencing and, and comparing that against the other sources uh, that, are, that are presented as well. Uh, and of course, we throw the facial biometrics into the mix. Uh, what percentage facial biometric score can we drive between uh, the face and selfie versus the face in the ID document and where appropriate, uh, the face from a digital footprint as well. Uh, and all this process can take as little as uh, 30 seconds for who you to do the work. We have both an automated document validation process that uses just our technology. Uh, and that's good, that's important because the quicker the process, the easier it is. And the quicker and easier the process, the less people drop out of that and the more people get across the finishing line uh, for our clients when they're doing customer onboarding. <clears throat> Um, where we can't verify the document using our technology, uh, we pass that over to our uh, manual document ana analysts um, and they look at the document using our own proprietary process to take them through a series of checks whereby they really um, go into much more detail on the ID document and come back with a decision on it uh, within an agreed uh, SLA. Uh, so what we're really doing at here, your secret source is to bring together all these different components so that it helps us uh, use the who you identity, um, the who you identify um, uh, decision making process to derive a score, an identity confidence score about this person. So this is a mock up of what a who you report looks like. We give a decision to say whether that customer has passed the who you identify request by virtue of have they done the things that our client wanted them to do? Have they provided um, something that confirms name and date of birth? have they provided something that confirms name and address. Uh, so we, make, we only ever pass a customer if they pass the rules uh, that we worked up with our particular client, the FinTech, um, but we also give an identity confidence score. Uh, this is where who is very, very different uh, from traditional document validation or traditional database checks. What we're doing here is we're asking the customer to provide enough sources to give us enough instances of seeing the same name, the same address, the same date of birth, uh, and making sure that all the information tallies and corroborates and fits together nicely. Uh, and this is where the, the risk-based approach aspect of who you comes in so well, in that uh, let's say that a FinTech was onboarding a low risk customer, uh, there was no overdraft, there's no history of fraud in that particular postcode, then they might say, oh, right, well, if this who you request only needs to achieve 55%. But let's suppose that there's a higher risk customer that's coming in from a high risk postcode. It's a higher risk instrument. It's a high risk product. Then that verification request might need to achieve 65% for the user to pass. So in other words, the scope of the who you request can be scaled up or down based on the risk that the um, our client sees in that particular um, account opening process. Uh, we have uh, lots of different uh, ways to deploy who you. Uh, some clients use WHOU um, 
by sending a who request uh, from uh, the back office service, whereby they just have to enter in the user's name, address, date of birth, um, and email address or phone number. And then they receive a fully branded who you request uh, by email or text. Uh, but commonly, we get better results when our clients integrate who you into their website or into their app uh, using either the iframe integration or the API integration. So it's important to be able to uh, trigger KYC processes from whichever part of the customer lifecycle or business process uh, that you find yourself in. And of course, uh, there's lots of reporting tools in our dashboard uh, whereby our clients can manage their review queue, <clears throat> can uh, allocate certain verifications to certain uh, of their staff uh, and really lock down that process. Uh, so really what we're trying to do at WHOU is to provide a complete view of identity to not be bound just by traditional database checks and at the same time not just rely on uh, traditional ID document validation checks but really to try and provide a whole a holistic view of the customer by using multiple sources to drive higher confidence that your customers are who they say they are. Thank you very much Dave. Uh, okay over to, to questions. Uh, my colleague uh, sitting opposite me, who's uh, sat there silently uh, throughout this, Vicky, uh, I believe you may have some questions that have been posted to us. Yeah, so we have um, one question, um, a couple coming through just now. Um, one, the first one is, how many banks are using this in the US? So if the question is uh, asked of the Who Investigate product, uh, the answer to that is none yet because it's only a UK um, service using uh, UK data. Um, if the question is uh, how many banks in the US are using who you identify, uh, we do have some US clients, but our focus as a company so far has been very much um, has been very much fo um, focused on working in, in the UK. Um, so we do have a couple of US clients, but uh, what we do know is that the equivalent compliance requirements in the US, the um, the red flag um, alert rule, the Bank uh, Secrecy Act, who you really complies with those regulatory requirements uh, to make sure that firms are complying with their CIP, their customer identification program requirements uh, over, over in the US. In terms of banks here in the UK, uh, we have several banks as clients. We have uh, one of the largest banks uh, in the UK, a tier one retail bank who uses who you. Uh, we also have several challenger banks uh, like Counting Up, uh, who are the new way digital only banks uh, that are that are growing um, very very well? Okay, we've got a, another question here. Uh, do you think that users are getting the right balance of uh, convenience and compliance for customers? Uh, Dave, I, th I I personally think that they are, uh, especially when you talk through a who you uh, request and process. Um, if it is going on to a, an additional data needed or additional things, the customer doesn't uh, know this. The customer is just led through the journey from start to, to finish, uh, ease their way through regardless of, of what uh, rules have been put in place uh, by, the, by the organization. Uh, and therefore, the customer is still getting a, an excellent user experience flowing through from start to finish. Yeah, <clears throat> I'd, I'd agree with you, Simon. I think. Um, Based on the results of the survey, what uh, really came back to me is that uh, prepaid and fintech firms are already using a really wide range of technologies, but also they're using them intelligently. They're using them in a, in a waterfall fashion, uh, whereby uh, they use only minimal KYC processes on a risk-based approach to check name, address, date of birth. Uh, and of course, that's perfectly permissible um, in the eyes of the of the, the regulators in this country. But that's, that's the standard you, you, you must achieve. Um, and uh, then where they see greater risk, then firms use more technology. So I think something like, um, it's, it's in the report, uh, which you can download from the website, from, the, from whoyoubusiness.com, but in the report it said that 39% um, of PIF members use multiple KYC processes. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think that, that FinTechs and, and PIF members are getting the balance right. Um, so we've had another question that's come through. Um, so given the current two by two database check requirement is unlikely to change in the near future, when do you think other digital footprint checks will be accepted as an alternative? That's a really, really difficult question. Um, 
So at the moment, the attitude of regulators is that they like the digital footprint analysis, but they don't see it as a replacement to, to, to the traditional database check. Um, there is some uh, re reason for that in that the traditional database, databases are what I like to call um, guarded and they're gated uh, when you try to get into them. So if you try to get into a credit reference agency database through one of their, their, their they're providing their members one of the banks, then the banks themselves are doing, doing checks on it. The electoral roll, for example, on the other hand, is not a, a, a gated database. So I kind of would dispute the rationale about not uh, permitting digital footprint analysis in uh, as soon as possible. Uh, in general, the more sources of information you have, uh, the better. Um, I think one of the things that will uh, drive a wide range of approved regulated uh, identity information sources is what the European uh, Banking Association are currently doing in terms of saying that EID databases uh, can be used, are perfectly permissible for account opening by banks uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the European Union. So I think that's something that will drive change um, in the traditional sources, list of sources that can be used. Um, but at the moment, whilst regulators um, like it, because it's an additional form of defence against fraudsters, they're still not there in terms of saying, yes, it's, it's perfectly permissible. But then again, a lot of the regulation in the UK um, is, you know, as we know, it, financial um, services regulation is outcome based, not prescriptive about how you do something. So as long as you, the regulated entity, can prove to the regulator that you're going through um, a series of steps to prove that you're, you're doing your due diligence, then the regulator just wants to see you've got a, an overall methodology there and they're not, they're not that concerned around the steps you use to get to that conclusion. We've got another question here. Uh, is uh, oh okay, this, this one. Uh, who can join PIF? I'll throw that over to Diane. Quite uh, well. PIF is um, is is open to to, to anyone uh, who um, operates in the the, the prepaid and, and fintech sectors um, on a uh, on a, a representational level. Um, we represent uh, firms who are regulated. Um, either by e-money or payment services uh, legislation, um, but of course we're we're open to um, to everybody who operates in the prepaid and fintech space um, as a as a supplier of um, services to the industry, um, as well as uh, others um, who are involved in this uh, very dynamic and fast-growing industry. Excellent. Uh, we've got another question here. Uh, is uh, who you identify a global service? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it can be used uh, across the across the globe, and we have customers ranging from where's our where's our furthest afield, Dave? Uh, furthest along is probably Australia. Australia. Yeah. Um, and again, yeah, it's a, we have a 24-hour document checking service, all based in the UK. Um, so if it does go to uh, manual <clears throat> doc checkers, we have them here working all yep. night. So, um, and, and also it's, it's uh, the documents can be checked, work for um, any country in the world, uh, driving license, passport, ID card, of course, in the countries where they have an, an ID card. Um, and the digital footprint analysis is obviously a global service. One of the sources we use is, uh, for example, is vContactor, uh, which is the, uh, the uh, Russian and uh, Eastern European equivalent of Facebook. Um, the PEPs and sanctions um, services we use uh, is global in nature as well. So yeah, who is very much a, a global um, uh, service. Uh, and of course, even for our clients here in the UK, we see that a large percentage of their customers that fail initial database checks are of course uh, new to country, are UK domiciled, but come from, uh, from, from lots of other places as well. Is that gonna be one of the things that changes regulations as uh, as society changes, as the generations that are using this technology uh, get older and, and become more prevalent with it, and traditional database checks become less useful as we stop appearing on them, uh, as we opt out of things, is that one of the things that's probably going to end up forcing regulators' hands to say, look, we need to actually uh, develop uh, and take on board the, these new technologies? Yeah, I think it needs to come from both sides. It needs to come from uh, from prepaid uh, program managers uh, and fintechs and also the card schemes themselves to be able to say to um, the regulators, look, these are the processes that our, that our merchants are using um, 
looking at it, it goes far beyond traditional name, name and date of birth checking from, from, from databases. Um, uh, I, th I think, think yes, it absolutely has to has to go that way. But it also has to come from the regulators as well. The regulators need to uh, go beyond their comfort zone. And to be fair to the FCA, I've seen a, a market change in uh, the FCA's attitude to KYC technologies and understanding of, of KYC technologies in the last five years compared to what it was like uh, you know, going back 10, 10 or 15 years. The FCA, in terms of how well they embrace RegTech, is a different organisation now compared to what it was um, on two years ago. Okay, uh, do you want to read that? Yeah, sure. Uh, another question. Uh, does who you offer a service that checks UK valid bank account slash sort codes for individuals and corporates? Um, yeah, the simple answer to that is no, we don't. Um, but we can certainly uh, find you a partner who, who, who does. Um, uh, one of the digital footprint sources we use uh, will in fact um, confirm that the customer has a, a valid bank account. Um, but no, we don't have a service uh, like Bank is Absolute that goes off and checks card numbers, um, bank account numbers, sort codes, and confirms it as part of a valid, uh, a valid, uh, a valid identity piece of information. Okay, looks like we've reached the end of our end of our questions and finished just slightly early, giving you all the ten minutes back. So uh, I'd like to thank you for for joining today. And thank you very much for me. Thank you very much for me. Have a nice <laughs> afternoon. Thank you very much. Cheers.